Good morning. Just got a few announcements for you this morning. First, the community prayer. Uh, we'll be meeting this Tuesday at 11 o'clock at the Presbyterian Church. Or, no, First Christian Church. It's across from the Presbyterian Church. <laughs> My eyes skipped a little bit on the reading. Next, the Ministerian Picnic is on September 22nd. We are in charge of the buns. They will be providing hot dogs and the hamburgers, but we are in charge of the buns. Something really interesting uh, that I read was uh, some people don't consider a hot dog a sandwich. So, what is it? I don't know. <laughs> I, I call it a sandwich. I've always known it as a sandwich. <laughs> But there's, I think, about 50, at least close to 50% of people in America don't consider a hot dog a sandwich. Just a little interesting tidbit there. Also, the nursery is fully staffed for the morning worship service and Christian education. Please rem And uh, finally, please remember to, and I should never say finally because I know that's not a good thing for a, a preacher to say is finally. But finally... Please fill out all friendship folders. Uh, you're, they're the little brown things on the end of the pews. If you want to know information about us, we first have to have information about you. So that's all I have. Good morning. Amen. Amen. That's right. God is doing amazing things in our lives. He's doing amazing things right now in a lot of people's lives, in other parts of the country probably, or the state, because there are a lot of people away on vacation taking time off, which is perfectly fine. It just makes, I hope that there's people online. I hope that people are taking time. All I ask, we all we ever ask is if you're away, that you just spend some time somehow, whether it's online with us or another church or you attend another church, just to take some time out on Sunday. Because Sundays are designed to stop and think about God, think about Jesus, think about what he did. I love the video. Uh, they didn't turn it up loud enough because it, as far as I was concerned, the, the, the seats should have been vibrating with, the, with that video. One thing that we have to learn, one thing you have to understand is when we get to heaven, and, and everything, it's, it's not going to be a quiet time. Uh, it's it's going to be pretty loud. The worship services are going to be pretty loud. I mean, if you, look at, if you look at all the times the heavenly beings came down, and, and you know, especially at Jesus' birth, you know, it was a little, hey, Jesus, come on, let's get this going. You know, even when Jesus arose from the grave, it was like, it was, a, it was an earthquake. It was, it was a loud thing. Everything that Jesus does is big. It's big. It's loud. It's amazing. Because we don't have a little God. We serve an awesome, mighty, big God. And uh, he's a tremendous God. And it's so, so wonderful to have everybody here. I'm so glad you are here with us. If you're online, please like us or share, share something with us. Say hi to us. Because we are all here together serving Jesus. And hey... One of the coolest things, and we don't hear this all the time, and we're hearing it more and more, is somebody had a, had a it must have been Josh. 
had a, I miss them in here now. You know, they, we, we now provide a time for them to go and be who they are, and now they're not in here being who they are, running up and down the aisles. And, you know, moms are more relaxed. Hey, this is so cool. I'm enjoying this today. <laughs> but it was good to hear the, the, the laughter of children, and that's, that's great to hear. So anyways, we're going to have a great time celebrating Jesus this morning. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of his faithful people. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. Let's pray. God, this morning... We are here to celebrate you. Because, Lord, you give us the victory. Even though at times we feel like we're defeated, you provide the victory. Because you are the victor. God, we're here, we celebrate that you are the creator. You create everything, and everything is just amazing. We can take a look at what we see outside, no matter what the weather is, and see that you created it, and it created it awesome. Let's pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join, it, join in the, uh, I was going to say singing, but we're doing that after. Please stand and join in reciting the, the creed that unites Christians everywhere. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Let us sing a new song.
David Crowder originally wrote in that lyrics, a wet sloppy kiss. And, and, and I like that better because it gives us an idea that God just grabs us, pulls us close, and just plants one right on our forehead, right on our cheek. And his whole being is his kiss towards us. We are just engulfed in his love, in the love of Jesus. That's what we're here this morning to do, to be in the love of Jesus. There are some needs throughout our church that we've been praying for. They are on our prayer sheet listed. We've been praying for people throughout the week. Pray for Michael, his friend that we were praying for this past week. He did die uh, yesterday, and uh, Michael is obviously upset about it. We just want to remember Michael in prayer. Also, just one other prayer request that isn't in our bulletin. Pray for our teachers. I was going to have everybody pray for the students because school is starting this week. And then I thought, no, pray for the teachers. <laughs> because now that now that they've all been home and undisciplined, now they're going to go back and the teachers are now going to have to re-discipline them and shape them into what they need to be. And really, our teachers are very special people. And we need to remember our teachers so much as they prepare to invite new kids into their lives because they are the ones that they are part of the ones who make a difference in their lives. Let's bow our heads this morning if you'd like to come forward at this time to be anointed or, or to just pray. You're more than welcome to come forward. Lord, hear our prayers we take time as a congregation, as we take time to pray, to talk to you,
as we sit this morning, just listening to the music, we're going to pass out the elements of the Lord's Supper. And as we take these elements, just sit quietly and prayerfully. These elements are not the actual body and blood of Jesus, but just think about the sacrifice that Jesus made. As you hold the elements, just think about the love of Jesus and allow Jesus' love to just be poured upon you with the understanding and knowing that he cares for you. Thank you. Thank you for the sacrifice you made for us. We thank you for your salvation, Lord. We ask you to bless these elements. Allow them to be a reminder of the cross. A reminder of the love that you shared for us by giving yourself up for us. the night on which our Lord Jesus was given over to suffering and death through the betrayal of a friend he took bread and after he had blessed it and given thanks for it he gave it to his disciples and said take eat this is my body which is given for you After the supper, he took the cup, and after he had blessed it and given thanks, he said, Drink all of this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the remission of your sins. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for being here with us this morning.
I'd like you to open up your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We are working through the 8th chapter of Corinthians today, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to be reading 1 through 12, and I have, under, I have really been amazed at 2 Corinthians. I, I, I've really not studied it as much as I have other letters that Paul has written, and I find the letter to second letter to Corinthians a very interesting letter. I found out that a lot of the stuff that he wrote about, you can't just touch on it, you know, in, in 30 minutes, 45 minutes, depending on who, 15 minutes, depending on who's preaching. That's right, JR is preaching next week, so do plan on getting out of here relatively early. <laughs> No, I'm sorry, you won't get out early. Next week, Adeline is giving Compassionate Ministry update, and so you will not get out of here <laughs> early. I hope Adeline wasn't listening to that one. Anyways, so I want you to, uh, we're going to look at 2 Corinthians. The thing about 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, Paul is scolding the, the Corinthian church, he's telling them, you know, you call yourself a Christian, you're doing all these things, and how horrible, and he's really giving it to them. And in 2 Corinthians, he's a little bit softer. And really, in 2 Corinthians, what Paul is trying to do is help the Corinthian church understand, help the church understand that there is a process of maturity that must go on in all of us. We need, when we come into a relationship with Jesus, we need to be mature. We can no longer continue in the way that we are living, but we need to advance from whom we are into a life of maturity, and that maturity is the result of grace. I've talked about how there's two sides of grace. We always talk about the one side of grace, that God is going to forgive you no matter what you do. God's going to forgive you. God's grace is going to come upon you, and he's going to smile upon you. If you ask for forgiveness, he's going to forgive you, and, he, and, and this is God's grace because he loves you. We never talk in what I call the flip side of grace, that when we receive the grace of God, something happens to us, and we make a change. We do things differently. could be a moral change. could be a character change, an ethical change, but there is a change about us. When we come face-to-face -face with Jesus, that just doesn't like, oh, wow, things are different. A good example of this is Paul. Paul's walking down the street, got letters to go kill the Christians. He's very zealous about God, meets Jesus, meets Jesus face to face. Cloud comes away. Everybody's in wonder. He can't speak. Things are different. Because when we come face to face with Jesus, when we truly are in love with Jesus, and he has forgiven us of our sins, then... There, which is grace, then there has to be a change. So throughout 2 Corinthians, Paul is talking about how the grace of God changes us, what we should do. Grace is when we experience God's favor even though we do not earn it and we don't deserve it. Can't earn God's grace. We don't deserve God's grace. It is given to us freely, and all we have to do is accept it. And that's why I say that grace is the most important concept because without grace, we do not have forgiveness. There is no salvation. There is no Bible. As a matter of fact, without grace, there's none of us because we only exist out of the grace of God. We are created out of love, and God wants to bring us back into that love because we have gone out and we decided that our way is better. When the grace of God comes upon us and we experience Jesus, we are awakened in the image of God. We are awakened in the image of God, and we begin a process of maturity, of growing up. Uh, there's sometimes I think we soften Paul. <laughs> there's a lot of times that when we when when the um, when the New Testament, when Paul's letters were written, there are times where I think we soften Paul a little bit too much. When he talks about maturity and he talks about different things. You know, he basically is looking at the church and saying, you know, grow up already. You don't do, continue to do, do those things. You don't continue to, to live the way and to be what you were. And so we need to grow up. And grace calls each person to a life of maturity. And that life of maturity is in every aspect of our life. When we encounter grace, it causes us to stop 
look our, at ourselves and deals with how we can add value to another person. It's no longer about what I want. It's now how can I add value to another person? How can I help out my neighbor? Whoever our neighbor is. Our neighbor is everybody in the world. Everybody we have, there are 8 billion neighbors in our world. And our whole idea is that every day we come into contact with one or two or a few of them. We want to understand how can we add value to that person's life? How can we help that person out? How we can love them? We are to become graceful people in the way that we respond and react to the world around us. <laughs> I thought about that word, graceful people. We've heard that about, are you a graceful person? We've heard that word a lot. You know, when I hear that word, you know, we, 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 we sing about it on an occasion. We talk about it. We talk about being gracefully broken, gracefully done, gracefully created. Gracefully sounds like being nice, proper. Being nice, even though the person does not deserve us being nice to them. That's how, you know, grace is like this. We come to church, or it doesn't even have to be church. We come to work, or we go home. <laughs> and we smile and say, oh, how you doing? Isn't it wonderful? Even though you're saying, boy, I really don't want to encounter you right now. I'm not really happy with you, or I don't like you, or you're this, or you're that, or, I, you know, I really don't want to be around this culture, or you scare me, or you make me nervous, or whatever it is, the idea is that that's not grace. We don't do things gracefully. Grace is so much more. I realized this week that Paul is calling all followers of Jesus not to be graceful, because that word graceful does not exist in the Bible. Neither does the word I made up. He doesn't call us to be graceful. He calls us to be grace-filled. And there's a difference between being graceful and grace-filled. Yes, Marcus turned on the side lights. You did not just see a power surge, but the lights did come on. So, <laughs> Ooh, cool. All right. Being grace-filled means that we do everything by the grace of God. We live our lives in a way that shows God's grace in us. The fruits of the Spirit are grace-filled actions or grace-filled attitude. 2 Corinthians 13 is not for the couples, but that is to show us how we are to express grace-filled love. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul goes further about being grace-filled and the reason and, and, and how that being grace-filled goes beyond just our actions, just our thoughts, just our character, but there's something else that Paul begins to talk about in, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. But before J.R. reads, just a little bit of background. And this will kind of make sense as, as time goes on. Within the church, church the church pretty much started in, in the city of Jerusalem. They were all excited about what was going on. Holy Spirit came upon them. They went out and started preaching the gospel. Somewhere along the line, someone told the church in Jerusalem that they had to sell all their possessions and give it away to the poor. So the church began to sell their possessions, and they gave everything away to the poor, and at the same time, persecution of the church happened, and there was an economic downturn within Jerusalem, within the Roman Empire, and things got pretty bad in Jerusalem because they had no money, no homes, no car, no camels, nothing, because they sold it all and gave it away. Well, there was a big problem within the church of Jerusalem, and as Paul cr traveled the countryside, he began to take up an offering for the Jerusalem church. And in chapter... In Acts chapter 8, Paul is talking to the Corinthian church about the offering that they gave to the Jerusalem church. J.R. is going to read 2 Corinthians. That means J.R. is going to get up, move to the podium. J.R. is going to read 2 Corinthians 8, 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 12. <clears throat> 
And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they came, gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that through he was, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that the, your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. So what's happening here is Paul's writing and he's begin, he talks about the churches in Macedonia. When, uh, during Paul's first mercenary journey, up in the northeast sector of the Roman Empire, there is this area called Macedonia, and he planted three churches, Thessalonica, Philippi, and a church called Berea. Two of his letters, really the Philippian letter went to Berea, but he sent letters to these two churches. And Paul is now describing these churches to the Corinthian church because not to compare and contrast the two churches, but to give an example of what God is doing within the Macedonian churches, within the small cluster of churches. And we read in, in verse 2, he says, In the midst of a very severe trial, trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich ger generosity. The churches were suffering, and Paul describes the suffering as a severe trial and extreme poverty. They weren't just going through trials and poverty. They were going through a severe trial. There was something pressing in on them, and they were going through extreme poverty. This was not the simple economic downturn or double-digit inflation. The way Paul makes us think that there was going through a type of persecution as well as an economic struggle within the region. Whatever was occurring, one thing we understand is that it was life-threatening. These churches were in a desperate situation, and they were in a situation that could take their life and their family's life. <clears throat> they were hungry, and they were social outcasts, yet they gave to the work of Christ. So here we have extreme, uh, well here we have severe trials and extreme poverty. And how did they give? Okay, so the, okay, so the passive scripture wasn't up there because I didn't press the button. How did they give? They, let's go back. Go, hang on, go back to, okay. In the midst of very extreme poverty trial and, and, and overflowing joy and their extreme power welled up. Um, yeah, so, so, okay, all right, let's back up. Take inventory of what we're doing <laughs> and proceed forward. Paul writes, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. So how did these Macedonian churches give? Joyfully. Here they are, an intense, you know, severe trial, 
say, intense trial. Poverty is, they've lost pretty much everything. It's about to go crazy for them. Everything was, and they are giving joyfully. Not just joyfully, but overflowing joy. They gave from their heart. They heard about the need in Jerusalem. They heard what was going on, and they wanted to do something. So they gave, so they gave what they could do. They gave what they had in order to help others out. People that were in extreme poverty and severe trial. Paul goes on in verse 3, and he says, For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their abilities. Wow. How you like that? Here's a church that is going through some major struggle in Macedonia. We know it's tough, and they not only gave to the Jerusalem church, but some of them even gave beyond their ability to, to, to give. Paul, they, they, so what they did is they went home, looked about their bank accounts, noticed how much money they had, and they joyfully, happily gave with excitement. This was exciting for them. And, and Paul is very, very overwhelmed at the generosity of the Macedonian churches. They didn't go home, they did not go home and say, okay, do we have money for food? Are we going to pay the mortgage? Do we owe money on our cars? Okay, do we have enough money for gas? And now what's left over? See, Paul talks about that they gave first. They gave to God first. And what they did is because they were so excited about what happened, the Macedonian churches gave first. Didn't matter if they could pay everything because nothing really mattered. Because for them, even their own bodies were not owned by them but owned by God. And so they gave beyond their abilities. They gave beyond their ability to give. They found a way to give. They sold lemonade on the street. They had flea teaks. They got rid of some of their old stuff. They planted crops. They did something in order to be able to help out their Jerusalem Christians because they heard that the Jerusalem Christians were in need. They gave above and beyond what they were giving to the work of Jesus within their community. So get this. Not only were they giving, because we have an assumption here that they were giving within their own community, but they gave not only to them, but above and beyond, and gave more, but they didn't take it from the, another place. They gave and beyond what they were already doing. They didn't take it from one offering. They didn't say, well, Paul's money is going to have to be taken away so we can give it to Jerusalem. They saw the need. They continued with their responsibilities, and they paid above those responsibilities freely Happily, joyously. And get this, entirely on their own. They didn't sit in front of an evangelist who browbeat them into giving. The pastor did not give this sermon about how we desperately need money. They didn't have it posted in the bulletin how much money we have and how much money we need and we need to step up. There was no guilt involved. And they didn't sit under a pastor pouring guilt upon them. So at the end of the service, well, I guess I should throw a 20 in the plate because, you know, that will relieve my guilt. No, they gave on their own. No one went to their homes to see what they had. They didn't demand it. Paul didn't walk up with armed guards and say, hey, pay like the tax collectors did. They gave entirely on their own. If you, look, if you go ahead and look on, uh, in, at verse 4, it says, they urgently, get this, get this, okay? Get this. This is so cool. Verse 4. They urgently pleaded with Paul to give. <laughs> Paul is like, 
no, you guys need the money for yourself. And they're actually on the floor begging, no, 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 here, you got to take this, Paul. Here, here, Paul, Paul, take this. Here, no, no, Paul, take this. We want to give. We, they begged Paul to give. Paul wouldn't take it. And they're just like throwing this money or whatever they had at Paul. And he had no choice but to take it. Everything they owned belonged to God. It came from God, and they returned it to God. The Christians and Macedonians had this zeal because they thought of themselves as rich. The Macedonian churches had the zeal to give because they thought themselves as rich. That's why Paul goes on in verse 9 and gives the example of Jesus as being, a, 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 a how Jesus is the greatest giver of all of humanity. Paul, uh, verse 9, Paul writes, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, that though he was rich, Jesus was rich. Now, this word, pelusio, Pelusios really is a material rich. And the more and more I read for pe from people, all writers, theologians, commentators, everybody writing stuff, really wants to stay away from the fact that Jesus was monetarily rich. And I'm not going to spell that out for you because we'll be here for another 20, 30 minutes. And, and I know, you know, in about 20 minutes, your stomach clocks are all going to go out and you're off. And you're going to be like, I just need to go home and eat now, Pastor. And, and I don't want to get into that. But there are certain aspects of Jesus' journey that shows that he wasn't poor. He chose to be poor, but he wasn't monetarily poor. He was not homeless. He owned a home. And, and when he journeyed, he was very rich because of the people that gave around him. But Jesus had a sense of wealth. He had a, he, he had a, he had a monetary wealth that was there that he tapped into that helped him throughout his ministry. Just for an example, okay, just so you understand, at his birth, when the wise men came, they gave enough gold to get them not only into Egypt, to care for his, him as he grew up, and the gold even lasted him into his ministry. See, those, those magi, those kings, they came over. They just didn't bring a little bag of gold and say, here's $20. I would estimate that they probably brought somewhere around $100 million worth of gold that isn't astronomical, but enough to pay off the Egyptians to get into Egypt, enough to care for he and his family, and then enough to do the ministry within, when, when he finally came out, with, within his movement throughout the world. Jesus was not affected by this because he was focused on what was important. And it wasn't money, but it was helping the needs of other. I am sure that Jesus gave most of that money away to help different people, different organizations, di to advance. Not organizations that were doing good for people, but people who advanced the kingdom of God. But this richness, there's a second part of this richness that we can add to this because he was rich because he was the son of God. He, he, he lived in eternity. He was in heaven. He enjoyed the splendors of heaven. He was the one true God. He did not have to worry about anything because everything existed because he existed. He didn't have to even, even if there was, no, get this. What, do you remember when Paul, they were saying, hey, uh, you haven't paid your temple tax or your tax on the Caesar yet. What did he do? Caught a fish, pull a coin out of the fish's mouth, okay? Jesus could probably replicate as much money as he wanted, and it wouldn't be real money. It wouldn't be fake money, okay? Because that's how 
you know, Jesus turned water into wine. Why can't he turn bad money into good money? <laughs> All right, you know, whatever. You know, <laughs> just kind of showing you a little bit of things that we kind of scoot over, but if you add them up, we see that God, w Jesus was not the impoverished homeless person that we think he was, okay? Then Paul goes on to say that although Jesus was rich, he became poor. Jesus chose to not live comfortably. It isn't that he gave up all his money that he, that he had, uh, even though he did give up some. It's that the way he chose to live his life. Cho Jesus chose to live his life in the world with humans. Jesus became poor in so much as he became a human being. He became one of us. Paul's letters to the Philippian church, he writes, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. By being God, he gave up being God, even though he remained being God, and became a human. And he became one of us. And he became poor. You see, the, 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 the Macedonian church knew he was rich. They were rich because Jesus became poor. Jesus had all this splendor all this morning. He gave that all up to become poor. Jesus was now, he left the splendors of heaven to now live in Satan's domain. He stepped out of eternity and became human in which now he was exposed to the sin of this world. Paul finishes up and he says, so that through his poverty, so that you through his poverty might become rich. The reason why the Macedonian churches believed that they were rich and could give above their means is because they understood that Jesus gave all of his riches up so that we can become rich. For the Macedonian churches, richness was not about how much money we have, but being rich was about the richness of Jesus, the richness of Jesus' love in their lives. He, Jesus didn't think about what was going to happen when he stepped out of heaven. He willingly stepped out of heaven, and he willingly gave up everything so that we can inherit heaven. And when the Macedonian churches found out, hey, we're inheriting heaven because now we are in a relationship with Jesus, there was nothing more, nothing more expensive, nothing more valuable than that relationship. And so... Their Jerusalem friends needed help. Man, what they did is they dug down deep. They pulled that money out. And boom, 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 boom. They didn't care. They were rich because of what Jesus did for them. Grace is not about receiving God's favor. It is about imitating Jesus in every aspect of life. It is about loving the way Jesus loves. To be a grace-filled person we should be practicing the art of giving the way Jesus modeled it. Grace-filled people are generous people. Grace-filled people do not worry about money because their riches are not in heaven, but <laughs> back up. They are grace-filled people because their riches are not here in this world, but their richness is in heaven. Paul writes in verse 10. So here we go. We're, Paul begins to write about the art of giving. And we, well, if you want to be a grace-filled person, we need to then model this art of giving, th this, this way of giving. Verse 10, he says, and here in my, is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. They nurtured their giving. So Paul is saying, look, look, I'm not blasting you guys. Look, I'm not saying that you don't give. And I'm not talking to our church that we don't give because we do give. We have given when we've seen, when we've heard of a need, 
we have given, and we've done a lot of good things. And I'm amazed how much money we make as a church, how much money is given to the church. And so this is, first of all, this is this is first Second Corinthians chapter eight. Didn't know this was about it. Can't skip over it because this was planned for today. But my point is this: I'm not chastising our church or anybody about not giving. Paul is saying here, hey, look, you need to have, you need to practice the art of giving. And in my judgment, I noticed that you were nurturing the art of giving. And nurturing the art of giving means that we do things in order to be ready to give. We have a lifestyle of giving. And even though we may not give now, there is a way that we're doing things that when we have the need, no problem. It's not even a sacrifice because I'm just going to give to God. It's a plan. It's a way to do. Um, he just wanted to make sure that they understood what they were doing when they gave to Jerusalem. And he was very, he was very happy that the Corinthian church nurtured the way that they were giving. They practiced it. They thought about it. It wasn't just saying, well, I'm in Sunday. Let's see. How good was the pastor's sermon today? Two dollars. <laughs> okay. Three dollars. Because, you know, you know, two or three dollars in an offering plate, that's really going to really put the lights on in our church and take care of the ministries of our church. You know, they, they weren't like that. They, ha they taught their children what to gay, what they, they <clears throat> what to give. They taught their children how to give. When I was a child, my mother nurtured the act of giving. I got a job with my next door neighbor, okay? I think it was like $20 a month or something. <laughs> I cleaned her yard and cut her grass, okay? You know, I can't live off of $20. I know. So what, I, whatever the amount was, she said, okay. So we went down to the bank. We deposited it, and she took $2 out. And she says, put this in an offering envelope. This goes to the church. goes back to God. And she nurtured in us the art of giving. We nurture in ourselves the art of giving by giving to God first. By not going through all of the bills and saying, what's left over belongs to God. That's why they always had... The, the, the Feast of the First Fruits. You gave what was first to God. They needed to nurture their desire to give. So when, you know, look, when you sit there and you look at the checkbook and you're like, man, I don't know what I'm going to give this, this, this month or this week or whatever, you're sitting there saying, God, forgive me for worrying about money. Man, Tanya's owned her business for... for for almost 20 years, hard to believe, 18 years. Man, there were some days I didn't know what was going to happen with this business. It was teetering, didn't know we were going to play our poise. There were some times where we didn't even take paychecks. Okay, there. we nurtured the art of giving by still giving. We have a history of a church that gives. We are, from the time that we are, are, are in, from, from the time that we were formed, we have a history of giving. We are only one of five churches that have paid all of their denominational budgets in full for 75 plus years. And we should be thankful for that. Even though we are at historic lows in attendance, we still pay our denominational budgets. So not only, not only is the art of giving, okay, not only do we nurture it, we have to be intentional givers. Be intentional in your giving. God doesn't, giving doesn't just happen. You don't wake up one morning and say, whoa, look at there. There's a pot of gold. <laughs> hey, I'm going to take some of that gold and give it to Jesus, okay? This doesn't show up. We don't wait until we get money to give. If you are waiting to receive more money to give, guess what you're never going to receive? More money to give. God does not provide until we accept his work and we begin to do his work 
and his will, and then he provides the resources. Never in the Bible does God say, you know, get this. I love Noah, right? Noah has a great, you know, Noah woke up one morning and said, okay, we're going to build an ark. A what? An ark. What's that? I don't know. We're going to build one. Yeah, what's going to happen? It's going to rain. What's rain? I don't know. It's supposed to fall from the sky, flood the earth. Okay. So Noah went back to bed, woke up the next morning, looked outside. Nothing happened. Went back to bed, woke up the next morning. Nothing happened. No, what Noah had to do was he knew that God wanted him to build an ark. He didn't know why. He didn't know what was going to happen. He said, okay, I'm going to build an ark. He went down, and he chopped down trees, and he got ridiculed, and he made and formed this ark. And then God provided the resources for that ark, the animals for safety. And it wasn't until Moses started doing what God wanted from him that he, pro he, that he provided the resources. Giving is a, it is not whether we give or not, it is how much are we willing to give. Giving is a grace issue. It is how much grace changed our lives. Did grace change us so much that we are going to give to the work of Jesus? If we have received Jesus' forgiveness, then Paul, this is Paul, he is basically saying, if you've received the grace of Jesus, the forgiveness of Jesus, then you should be giving. It's not if you give, it's what should I give. See, for if, we, if the willingness is there, the gift is accepted. Paul writes this, if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. See, Paul's like, you're poor, look at the Macedonian church. You don't have money, look at the Macedonian church. You can't afford to give, look at the Macedonian church. And we have Macedonian churches all throughout the world and all throughout our country. Churches and people that give above their ability to give. It should be, it's about what one has, not what one does not have. I don't, I, it's not, I don't have any money to give. It's what do I have to give? And that's what Paul is talking about. Within our lives, we should be determining how much we should be giving. And every follower of Jesus should be giving according to their means. No one is saying that you go home and sell your home and give it to God's work. No one is saying that you starve yourself for the sake of God's ministry. That's what they did in Jerusalem, <laughs> and it didn't work. We should be giving according to our means. Paul is clear that the Macedonian churches gave according to their means. Paul was giving guidelines that giving is not a rich thing, but he is, says in verse 8, I am not commanding you to do this, but I am giving you some guidelines in how you should give. This is not, this isn't you have money, I don't have money. This isn't about the middle class. This isn't about the rich people paying their fair share. This isn't about anything. Get off that junk that the media is telling us. This is, it does not matter what you have received. If you have received the gift, great. If you receive the grace of God in your life, then you are going to joyfully give no matter what. Now look, look, look. If you're giving and your income level goes down, yes, your giving might go down. We understand that. That's not what Paul is talking about. Paul is talking that there are some within the church that are not giving what they should be giving. Their money is tied up in all, so, all this worldly stuff 
that they're not giving what they are. They have not had an attitude. Their money is paycheck to paycheck to paycheck in such a way that they don't even begin to think about, hey, what happens if I have a friend in need? You know, that's going to have to come away from the church so I can give my neighbor some money. You know, how about this person? You know, and hey, the church needs a roof on the annex. Oh no, the church wants some, wants more money for me. The whole idea was Paul is saying is, hey, go home. Look at what you're giving. Understand being grace-filled means. Understand what Jesus did on the cross for you. Understand that he gave you all of this stuff. What are you going to give back to him? Well, I can't afford it. Yes, you can. Because, because giving is out of the love that we have for Jesus. You see, everyone should be giving no matter who they are or what their financial situation is. Every Christian should be giving to the work of God, the work of Jesus. That's what Paul is talking about. And somewhere along the line, all of us can cut something that we don't need so we can give that money to Jesus to continue to do his work. This is not a it is not an us versus them or who has the most money. It is we are all in this together. This morning, where are you at? What is God calling you to do? so keyed up about money we stay awake at night we wish that we had more money so we could be more generous hey I found myself doing that no different than you or are we practicing the art of giving by nurturing our giving intentional in our giving and by giving according to our means.
individually, challenge us as a church to begin to trust you, to allow you to take over every aspect of our lives. And that means that many of us may need to take that checkbook and write God on the front of it, the property of Jesus. Some of us may need to change the way we're doing life. I don't know. We all need to make sure that if we are grace-filled people, we give the way Jesus gave by giving up ourselves for our neighbors. Thank you. In your precious name. be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Please stand and join in the singing of the doxology.
day God has created for you.